What's going on guys? Here at the back of my propane gas forge and I wanted to fire up the camera and show you a very easy and relatively inexpensive way for monitoring temperature inside of your gas forge. And what this is, it's really just two basic items, maybe three if you count the power cord, which in this case is just an old lamp cord that I recycled off of an old lamp that no longer works. Uh, but the other two main items are going to be a temperature controller or a PID and a K-type thermal couple. Uh, and that's really just about it. Uh, it's very easy to hook up. Uh, on one side here, terminals one and two, you've got your incoming power which again is just a lamp cord at 110 volts AC. Uh, and then on the opposite side, you've got your thermocouple connections, negative and positive on terminal screws seven and eight. Uh, and there's actually a schematic right here on the side to show you where everything goes. Uh, three and four for this application, you don't have to worry about. That's just for a relay output. Uh, if you wanna think about that as just like an on off switch inside of this controller. Uh, it's for controlling or turning on and off a relay for controlling an external circuit, maybe a solenoid or a heating element or something like that. Uh, you've also got five and six is for an alarm output. Basically the same idea, uh, just an on and off switch to turn an alarm on or off. Uh, seven and eight, once again, is your thermal couple. 9 and 10, uh, I believe, is for a different type of temperature sensing device known as an RTD, or a resistance temperature detector. Uh, it's going to be very similar uh, as far as function or practical use as a thermal couple, uh, but we're using a thermal couple here. Uh, and then 11 and 12, uh, those don't actually exist. There's no terminals in that location. Uh, and that's really it. Now for this, I've just got a piece of Gorilla Tape over the back here to protect those somewhat exposed terminals to keep anything from maybe accidentally shorting across the two or from shocking myself. Uh, that works just fine for me. You know, ideally you should probably think about putting this into some kind of an enclosure. Uh, just make sure you buy one that's big enough for your application. You know, if you are gonna use this as a temperature controller, you will need some additional hardware, so you know make sure you buy an enclosure that's big enough for those as well. Uh, but do understand, for what this is and how I've got it set up here, it is just as a digital thermometer or a temperature monitoring device. Uh, even though it says temperature controller, I'm calling it a temperature controller, we're really not using this to physically control temperature in any way. Uh, it's just a dump thermometer. It's you know, information in, information out, uh, that's it. It reads, you know, what this K-type thermal couple is sensing, you know, translate it to a temperature, and that's what we're seeing here on the display. Uh, I cannot, with this controller, affect that in any way whatsoever. Uh, again, it's just as a basic dumb thermometer. Now, you can use this as a temperature controller, uh, but that's going to be a little bit beyond the scope of this video. And again, it will require some additional hardware such as relays, heat sinks, uh, external power supplies, uh, possibly solenoids or other things, uh, different connectors and hardware. Again, we're not really going to get into that. Uh, for our intents and purposes here, I just want to show you guys basically how to make a thermometer. So uh, that's the PID, a uh, little bit on it and its connections. Uh, just to show you specifically what brand I have here, this is a MyPin, M-Y-P-I-N, model TA4-RNR. Input, either thermocouple or RTD. Uh, output, it says as relay. Again, we're not really concerned with it uh, because we're only using the temperature readout feature on this. Uh, now, for the thermal couple, a uh, couple of quick notes on that. Uh, for whatever application you need to use something like this for, you know, in order to just read a temperature, make sure you are getting an appropriate K-type thermal couple. Not all K-type thermal couples are created equal. They're not all for the same, you know, high temperatures or low temperatures. You know, make sure you're getting one appropriate for the application it'll be used for. In this case, it's going into a forge that may see upwards of 24, 2500 degrees. 
you need something that's going to hold up to that heat, uh, which in this case is either going to be a stainless steel tipped probe, or even better would probably be a, a ceramic sheathed thermal couple or a ceramic thermal couple probe. Uh, you know, for what I'm doing, for what I'm using this for, stainless steel will work just fine. And they're typically just a little bit cheaper. Uh, so that's why I went with that in this application. Uh, do keep in mind, though, there still are a couple of little plastic parts and pieces on the back end here. Uh, so make sure it is far enough away from any of the main heat sources that it's not going to melt that. Uh, you do still have stainless braiding on the wire, uh, stainless on the probe, and that should be fine. Uh, now, as far as location for mine, I'm just sticking it through a snug hole that I drilled into a soft fire brick at the back center of my forge. And then I've just got it sticking past through the inside face of the brick, about an inch to an inch and a half into roughly the center area of that forge. Uh, and that should give me a pretty good approximation of the average interior temp of that forge. Uh, you know, just keep in mind, you don't necessarily want to have it right in line with the flame. Uh, you know, that's going to be a little bit of a hot spot, uh, especially in any single burner forges. Uh, and that could even potentially damage the end of your thermocouple probe. Uh, you know, keep it out of the path of the flame, uh, but just somewhere in the general area of the inside of the forge uh, where you can get a pretty good approximation of what you're seeing. Now, most forges, you know, especially this one, it may have some hot spots and relative cool spots. You know, just understand you're not going to have whatever temperature you're reading in every little cubic inch of that forge. You know, there will be some variations. Uh, but again, this is to give you an average or an approximation and just give you a little bit of a better visual, uh, especially if, like me, you're a little bit newer to forging and maybe not quite as used to judging, you know, colors or, you know, using temple sticks or whatever. Uh, this, I think, is about as easy as you can get for, you know, kind of understanding what the inside of your forge is doing or even what, you know, adjusting airflow or gas flow might do for temperature, either raising or lowering. And uh, in my opinion, it's just a really good way to go to see what's going on in there. Now, uh, as far as setup, uh, just real quickly, uh, it does come with a manual. It's a little bit of a Chinese to English manual, so it can be just a little bit hard to follow at times. Uh, there's a lot of videos online, especially from the homebrew guys that use these a lot for their setups or guys building heat treating ovens. You can find any number of videos on YouTube that go through each of these parameters, what they are and how to set them. You know, just look up this specific model, the TA4 or the T-Series by MyPin, and you should be able to find a lot. Uh, but for this purpose here as a temperature monitor for my forge, I only had to change two things. Uh, the first was to go into this menu here by holding the up and down buttons in for a few seconds until LSP started flashing. That stands for lower set point. That you can leave the same. Uh, the one we're interested in is the upper set point, which is at 1200. Now, its default is 1200 centigrade or 1200 Celsius. Uh, we're actually going to change that to Fahrenheit, or at least I did. Uh, but that default number, regardless, is going to be 1200, whether you're in Fahrenheit or Celsius. And this forge gets much, much hotter than that. So I ended up raising that to 3000. You know, you could even raise it all the way up to 9,999. Uh, it should be just fine. Just understand that it needs to be higher than the highest temperature that this thermal couple will see. Or your display is going to kind of zap out on you a little bit. And you're going to see four U's across the top. Uh, and that actually is mentioned here in the troubleshooting section. Uh, you know, it'll make it look like either your controller stopped working or your thermal couple's bad. Uh, in reality, you just maybe didn't set your upper set point high enough and you exceeded whatever that was. So uh, go ahead and change that, uh, you know, somewhere around 3,000 or even 9,999. Uh, and then second and lastly, uh, for me, I'm used to Fahrenheit, so I changed this parameter C to parameter F, 
which reads in Fahrenheit now. And to get into that menu, you just hold in the set key for a few seconds until AL1 pops up, and then you scroll through until you get to C hyphen F. And that's pretty much it, guys. And uh, you do that, and you'll have a very cheap and effective temperature monitor or thermometer for the inside of your forge. And, you know, honestly, you could use this in any other number of applications from monitoring your quench oil and your quench tank. Uh, if you've got a tempering oven, it'll give you a very reasonable, you know, reading of what that'll be, much more accurate than, you know, typically the built-in uh, temperature controls or dials on those cheaper ovens. Uh, if you want to use it to double-check a heat-treating furnace or a heat-treating kiln, uh, you can use it for that. Uh, just any number of applications that this will be useful for, all for a total cost of about $40, uh, give or take. So uh, this will run you about $25. Uh, that will run you about $13. Uh, and then the cord, you know, I got for free because I pulled it off of something I already had. Uh, but even just going to the hardware store, you should be able to find one for probably a couple of bucks. Uh, that will work just fine. Uh, now, this one's not grounded uh, because I don't have it in any type of a steel or metal enclosure. And, you know, normally I've got this, you know, setting over here, you know, on my workbench and out of the way. Uh, if you are putting it into a metal enclosure, I would recommend getting a grounded power cord for that and grounding it to the enclosure. Uh, just in case one of those hot leads were to come loose, you won't end up shocking yourself on that enclosure or you know whatever it might be sitting on so uh, just a couple quick notes about that uh, hopefully I covered everything for you guys again there's far more functionality built into this thing uh, that you can use for a broad range of applications you know in temperature control from heating to cooling and so on uh, again, that's a little bit beyond the scope of what we're trying to do here or to show in this video. So I'm really not going to get too much into that. Uh, just understand that you do have those capabilities down the line should you need them. Uh, you'll just need a little bit of modification, you know, set up some different parameters, add a little bit of hardware and uh, a little bit of know-how and you'll be good to go. And, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, this is about the best option out there. Uh, you know, I do understand, uh, just real quick, uh, I do understand there are little handheld, you know, K-type thermometers and things. They kind of look like multimeters or whatever. You know, those are all well and good. I've read some bad reviews on those that they're not really all that accurate. Uh, you know, a lot of times they come with thermal couples that really aren't that great to begin with. You know, they take anywhere from two to four AA batteries or more, uh, you know, which those go bad. You got to keep changing those. A lot of them just really aren't that efficient on power consumption. You know, with this, you put in a power cord, you plug it in, you're good to go, and you don't have to worry about it. So uh, this is the method I prefer, and, you know, just the fact that I can then use it even as a controller by adding a couple basic features to it, uh, that just really seals the deal for me. And at the end of the day, it's going to be the same price, if not cheaper, uh, than a lot of those handheld units anyway. So uh, take it for what it's worth, guys. Uh, you know, buy the parts, try it out. I think you'll like it. Uh, I think it'll help you. And uh, if you can, go through the links I'm going to be including below. Uh, I would greatly appreciate that. And if you have any further questions, leave them below. I'll try to get to them. Uh, if this helps you out, hit that like button. Make sure you subscribe. And as always, I do appreciate you guys watching these and putting up with my incessant ramblings. And, uh, you know, thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.